Right, so our recording is now on. I'm going to hand you over to John Skaggs. Wonderful, Colin, thank you so much. Um, very excited to be back here again. Uh, last night, last week was a lot of fun uh, for those who were able to join. And uh, I'm excited to be back to have another session to, to kind of spread the love of the game to a few more people. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here so everybody can see. All right, there you go. And we'll go ahead and get rolling here. All right, so um, a little bit about myself. Uh, who is this guy on the screen talking to everybody here tonight? Um, so my name is John Skaggs. I played college baseball at Wayne State University. It's a division two school in Detroit, Michigan. I was a corner infielder and outfielder. Uh, the first base was my primary position. I played professionally down in Georgia, Macon, Georgia. Um, played independent ball down there for two and a half years. And I am currently the uh, high school baseball coach, head coach of Yorktown High School here in Arlington, Virginia. So I'm right outside of Washington, DC. Uh, I am the owner of Primetime Baseball. It's a, an academy here in uh, the DC area. I own Primetime with Chris Bursette. Uh, that may, name may sound familiar to some of you, but uh, Chris played I uh, was a catcher for the Great Britain national team, and Chris played uh, from 2009 to 2000, I believe, 1916, till 2016. And he played four years at the University of Michigan, as well as uh, seven years for the Cincinnati Reds. Um, and then I've had uh, the opportunity to coach all around the world, uh, from obviously the U.S., uh, Japan, China, Italy, Spain, Austria, Hungary, Germany, the Czech Republic, and Slovakia. I've coached anywhere from uh, the youth leagues. Uh, up to the professional leagues and also traveled with teams all around in these areas. Um, so I have a, have a pretty, pretty extensive baseball background, but definitely uh, I'm a student of the game as well. And that's one thing I've learned is you can never learn too much about this game because it's constantly changing and constantly growing. And um, you have to, you have to be able to adapt to the way the game changes. So um, once again, thanks for being here tonight. I'm excited to talk with you. So last week, uh, my session, what I did was I did infield. So last week, my presentation was all about infield drills and how to do different infield drills and indoors, outdoors, all over the place. Um, and, and just different, th different things that we use with our high school, college and our youth development teams. So this week, what we're going to be working on is uh, and discussing is going over some of those infield drills again, but also adding in different pitching drills, catching drills, outfield drills that you can do indoors. So the weather here in Washington, D.C. and where I'm from, Michigan, uh, from what I hear from Colin and uh, some of the other guys that I've, I've conversed with a lot is pretty similar, right? It's cold throughout the winter, miserable, can't really get outside as much. I hear it's windy there today for you guys. Um, but, you know, the summer, it's nice. In the spring, we can get outside, but a lot of times we're stuck indoors. And we have limited accessibility to a lot of things, such as what indoor space we have. Some people and some programs are very fortunate and have massive field houses and uh, turf areas that they can do a lot of work in. Some programs don't, and they they have real tiny space or tennis courts or squash courts or you know just a, a, a gym, and that's perfectly fine. So what we're going to do is I'm going to go over drills that you can use for all different positions in tiny spaces. Uh, or even on bigger spaces. And I'm also gonna go over a practice plan of how I develop our practices for our, our programs. All right, so um, one thing I do wanna talk about, so Primetime Baseball, it's a, it's a baseball academy, obviously here, and I said that I, I own with Chris uh, Brissett. And one of the things we have is we have travel teams from ages eight years old through uh, 18, and then we also have a college team where players from all around the United States and Canada come to play throughout the summer. And in these travel programs, we play year round, spring, summer, and fall, and then we train together in the winter. So we are, um, our space has five batting cages, a full weight room. We have a, um, a two pitching lanes and we have nets that can be moved around. So we have a very, very nice indoor space to do a lot of our training but we do have weekly indoor trainings with our teams, even though in the summer we can't get outside, we're still indoors. So um, definitely I have an extensive background in, in, the, in the indoor space, which we'll talk about. So 
before we get into today talking about the drills specifically, there's a couple of things I really want to touch on. One, when we're looking to do an indoor practice, and this is leading to how we would plan an indoor practice, um, it's super, super important that, to, that you plan ahead. Right? And, and you know, there's nothing worse than showing up to a practice and you know, maybe you're at work and you're late doing extra work. I'm a high school teacher full time. So maybe you were late um, and didn't have time to plan. Now you're trying to rush to throw something together. And most of the time, it's not going to be that great. I've been there. We've all as coaches been there. Um, but taking the time to try to plan ahead, converse if you have assistant coaches, um, some of the higher ups on your team, some of your better players, maybe see what you've been struggling on as a team or a program, but really go into that practice with a plan of what you want to work on, how to utilize your space. All right. The space that you talked about, everyone's going to have different space. Um, some will have a real big spots some will have small, some will have to share it with other sports, other programs. Um, but the best thing is to try to work with the space you have the best you can. There are hundreds and thousands of drills that you can do to work on every single skill set um, of the game. Right. We don't have to have a whole field to do an entire infield and uh, a whole field practice just to have a successful practice. You can do classroom work, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, but there's classroom work and there's discussions you can have that really will help grow their baseball knowledge, which is just as good as doing it out of field. Um, like I said, everyone would love to have the biggest space and as much room as possible, and be outside year round, like you were in Florida or, or California, but you know, it's not possible. Um, it's the best thing is to try to be creative and innovative with the space you have. And some of the drills we'll look at tonight are super creative. Um, I did not create them all. Some of them I did. A lot of them I borrowed from other people. Uh, I've learned, uh, I've adapted uh, because that's part of the game. And honestly, at the end of the day, anything you are doing to get these players active, involved in the game, hands-on in the game is better than doing nothing at all. So even in your eyes, you may think this, is, this was kind of a failure of a practice. I don't think it was that great. You had the boys and girls out there moving exercising cohesively being together that right there is a win in itself so don't don't be too disappointed if you don't think it was that great um movement the players have to move and i have this highlighted this bullet point find a way to keep players active and, and moving as much as possible the moment a player sits around or stands around for an extended period of time we're going to lose them um, we did, there was a study that came out about, uh, two months ago here in the States and, um, definitely probably, it might not have been done in the States, but it was brought to my attention in the education field. But, um, it was that back in 2014, the attention span of a high school, so 14 to 18 year old student, the attention span that you would have the, to kind of grab their attention, to keep their attention was roughly 14 to 15 seconds. All right, so 14 to 15 seconds, you're going to have them engaged. If you don't get them, you've lost them. They did this study about a year and a half ago, and they found out that that attention span has now dropped down to nine seconds. So from the 14, 15 seconds to nine, now we have nine seconds to keep their attention and to get them engaged. So the more time that they're standing around and not moving, we're losing them, right? So when we go through these drills that you're going to look at, we're going for reps, quick reps, effective reps with a lot of movement, a lot of rotation, because the more we keep them active and more hands-on, they're going to be engaged, right? Um, when this, and also when they're not regularly engaged and active, they're going to become bored. And a player who's bored at practice or bored at a game, we're going to lose them, right? We're going to lose them in a game, uh, lose them from the game of baseball. Uh, safety, that should definitely go without question. We've got to make sure that all the drills that we are doing, especially when a tight, a tight space, to try to make sure everybody stays as safe as possible. Um, when you have multiple drills going on at once, we have to make sure that just players and coaches are just keeping their, their heads up, making sure nobody's running into each other or has the potential to run into each other. Excuse me, so just try to plan ahead for that. And the final part is groups. Right. Our, um, I'm not sure the sizes and everyone will have different teams, whether the baseball or softball teams. You know, some teams will have 10 people showing up. Some will have 12, 14. Some may have up to 20 or maybe even more. But the best way to do it is to try to break players into positions 
and, or into groups and they um, can be position specific, but rotating them around. And we'll go into that in detail, but this is going to force players to try different positions that they may not be used to. All right. Um, until they get to the higher levels, most of these players are not going to be posi position specific. All right. Once you start to get to maybe 15, 14, 15, 16, these players like I'm a shortstop, I'm a middle infielder or I'm an outfielder. Right. But when they're new to the game or just learning the game, learning the, the basics or they're they're 12 and under, maybe 13 and under, let them play those multiple positions, because what we're going to do is we're going to see by them, you know, going and playing outfield or being a pitcher and doing drills or catching. Hey, maybe you're pretty good and you didn't even know. Right. But by us forcing them when they're new or younger to try it, we're going to see hopefully see some growth. Um, and uh, we're also going to see where those players excel and where they don't excel, right? Maybe little Billy is not a catcher. We see that real quick. He's not a catcher, All right? Maybe we try to get Billy out of that catching position. Uh, but what that's going to lead to is the versatility, right? These players are going to be more versatile in different positions. Um, I can think of numerous situations where I have one third baseman and he gets hurt. And I have to move somebody else to third base who has never played third base or isn't accustomed to third base. That's a failure on my part as a coach because I have not prepared my players to fill in in case of an injury or a sickness or whatever. So by having players be versatile and get reps in different positions, it exposes them. And then hopefully for your sake in the long run, will make your program and team better. So for indoor practices, there's zero um, uh, brand recognition or anything on this. Just so you know, I don't, uh, this, these are what we use, but I don't have exact ties to these companies, just a heads up. But these are a lot of the equipment that we use at our facility and for our indoor practices. Uh, we'll use plyo balls, um, driveline and tap balls are the brands that we use, um, but there are a lot of other ones on the market. But um, these are balls that we use for hitting, for ground balls, for catching drills, and for hitting drills and, and pitching throwing drills. We'll talk about that. Uh, Jager bands or J bands. Um, uh, met Alan, Alan a bunch of times. He's the founder of the company. Uh, he has a great long toss program, a great throwing program. Um, but his J bands we use for warm up for every single position, for every single practice. Um, each player has their own set. It's part of uh, our, our program and it allows the players to get, to get loose um, on a daily basis. Definitely, if you're unfamiliar, but I, I'm confident a lot of uh, GB is, that's definitely a great company. Um, we use a lot of training gloves and infield paddles um, to do our drills. Uh, we use mini gloves to do, do a lot of our infield drills um, and catching drills. Uh, uh, Chris Brissett loves the mini catching mitt to work on really hand-eye coordination and watching the ball the way in the glove. Um, we, we use pitching machines, and we're fortunate that we have, we have a few different we have uh, the pitch machines that shoot regular balls out um, and can throw different pitches, but we also have machines that throw some foam balls, um, some tennis balls, wiffle or plastic baseballs and softballs. Um, so we had something we are fortunate that not every program does have, but if you do, it's, it's obviously a great way to use space. And uh, the final thing, hand towels. Um, we'll do some drills for our pitchers and, and catchers using towels to, to get our body loose, but also to work on some pitch mechanics that we'll talk about today. All right, so the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go through a sample indoor practice. Okay, so um, when I go into a practice of what I'm going to do with my high school team or my travel program, like I said, I plan ahead. I know how much time I have. I know how many players are going to be attending, and I know how many coaches will be in attendance. Now, does that mean that a coach or a player is going to forget to come or be late? It happens every time. As much as I would love to have them there on time, everybody has their own life and a busy schedule and a random accident on the road on the way there. So, you know, sometimes it's a struggle. It's a, it's a scramble, but that's, uh, that's our job as a coach. So I'm going to put up here what we do. Like I said, every program is different based on their size, but I went with a smaller facility space that, we would, that you may have and a, uh, a team of anywhere from 15 to 20 players. Man, so we'll take a look at this. All right, so when we go to do a, an indoor practice, um, depending on the time uh, of year and, um, you know, the time of the season, 
and in the time of day you have anywhere from we have from 60 to 90 minutes to do our our work so um in that time we have anywhere from like you said 12 to 15 sometimes up to 20 players who are coming in at a time all right now what do we do during this time knowing that we maybe only have a gym to use do our training the first thing we have to do is warm our players up and if there's ever space if you're at a school and you can use the hallways and do this that's phenomenal because that eliminates the beginning but our first 15 minutes of a practice, if we don't have that extra space, is our warm up, And we are super, super big and strict on this because our players cannot go into a practice that they're not properly warmed up. We'll go into a dynamic warm-up um, where players, you know, high knees, butt kicks, uh, shuffles, lunges, you know, um, build our way up on sprints to get our bodies loose. Um, then we'll go in and we usually we'll do that as a team. My older players, um, when they get into high school and into college, they do their own kind of dynamic warm up. They know what their body needs. They're, they've done this for enough time. I, I kind of give them, once they earn the trust, I let them do their own thing. But for our younger and our newer teams, we lead this. We need to show them and teach them and mold them the right way so that when we get outside, they can do it more themselves. Um, we go into our J bands. Um, our J bands we use to, um, like I said, we use every day. I didn't want to go through and do a whole J-band circuit because you can Google that or look at the website, but um, using, our, using the J-bands to get your arms loose, no matter your position, is huge. Um, it's, a, it's a great way to get stretched. So if, you don't, if you're unfamiliar with that, definitely take a look at that. I can put the website up there for those. Uh, the plyo balls, um, sometimes we don't have much space to throw, right? If you're in a gym and there's 20 players, you can't, you can't really successfully do a lot of throwing um, in that tight space. So we'll bring our plyo balls and that's part of our warm up set. We'll throw those into the wall or into the mats um, and we'll go through our throwing routine, which we'll go through at the end of this um, presentation today. And if there is time and there is space and maybe we're doing more throwing drills that day, we will play catch. And if we can't play catch, but we have a big wall, maybe half the gym, we'll do our throws into the wall um, and have the ball bounce back and, and do that. So Playing catch, though, they said indoors, if we're not doing as much throwing, it's not as important um, during, that, during that time, as long as I'm able to go through our plyo ball routine to get our players loose. Uh, one thing I will say, I will definitely at the end of this, because I know I'm, I'm, we'll have people who have questions along the way. Um, at the very end, I'll do a little Q&A so I can answer and explain in more in detail questions you may have. So if you have uh, questions along the way, take little notes or something, and I'll, uh, I'll answer all of them for you. Um, the next thing we do is, as we talked about before, is we break into groups and, um, you know, the three groups that I have listed right here are infield, outfield, and hitting. Um, if you have a cage or even if it's just one cage, that's awesome. If not, there's still ways you can do it. Um, the hitting stuff we'll discuss, but we break into our three groups, all right? And we'll, by going into groups, it allows for smaller sizes, which means more reps for players in a shorter amount of time. So here in these three groups, each station is 15 minutes, all right? And I don't care who breaks up into who. If our younger players, like I said, to try to create that versatility, I just go one, two, three, that group, one, two, three, that group, one, two, three, that group, and then just disperse them out, however it is. For my older players, maybe they're more position specific. Hey, infielders over here, outfielders over here, catchers and pitchers, you go hit first, and then we'll rotate around that way. Um, but we break them into groups, more position specific, uh, more reps in a shorter period of time. After we've gone through that, uh, those four things, so the stretch and warm up, and our three stations, that right there's an hour. So if we only have an hour of practice, that is our hour of practice, right? And you got to think if there's four or five players in 15 minutes, they're going to get a couple hundred ground ball reps, a couple hundred swings off the tee or front toss or overhand or off the machine. Um, you know, they're going to get a lot of reps because there's only you know, four to five. If you have 12 to 15 players, you may, you may have even more reps than that. So smaller groups, more reps. If you have more time and you get that 90 minutes or even up to two hours, depending on it, this is where you can start to go different routes. Every single practice we do, we try to have some type of competition to end practice with. I feel, um, and you know, I know as an American, I may have a different opinion of this, but I don't think the youth that we have even here in the States 
are big at the younger ages at competing. They play games, right? They're all, they all play baseball and stuff. And yes, they all want to win. But I don't think that a lot of the kids right now these days are as competitive as they were or can be. And maybe I'm dating myself. I'm 35 right now. But I just think that um, players aren't as competitive. So um, And also fold tend to fold under pressure. So what we do is we try to put those our players into a, as close of a game-like atmosphere as we possibly can on every drill we do and every practice we do. Um, and that's how we do these competitions. So what we do is after we break into groups, we'll come together and we'll do a, whether it's a hitting competition or a ground ball competition or a hitting a ball off of a tee or a hitting a target competition. We'll put everybody against each other or we'll have two teams and have them compete. Um, and everyone goes together, everyone's doing it. And this is where team bonding starts to come, right? Players are picking each other up. Players are pushing their teammates. Someone misses it. You know, everyone's like, oh man, come on, let's go next person. But it builds this team chemistry that we're trying to get. It builds a cohesiveness between it. But the underlying effect is it is building competition. We are making competitors out of our players. And that's what we need to do because when we get on the field, we're competing against someone else. So if they can come together and compete against themselves and be super competitive, they're going to have no problem attacking another team or another program. All right. So always have a competition and somebody has to win. There has to be a winner. Okay. And the reason being, if you do a competition and you go through and both teams are going super hard and all of a sudden it's like, all right, that's it. It's over. They're looking around like, what? There's no winner. You need a winner. Right. So go through these competitions and have a winner because we want the team that didn't win to know that defeat and want to make that those strides to be better next time that there's a competition. Try to get that win. If you do have more time after the competition, then we can add in workouts, conditioning. But one of the things I've found in my years as I've been coaching now for, you know, since I got done playing almost 15 years we need to make these, these conditionings and these workouts as baseball or softball specific as we can, All right? So for example, there's nothing worse than think back to when you were playing growing up. When the coach for us, I played basketball too, but when the coach says, all right, on the line, you're like, oh my gosh, we're gonna run, All right? And no one wants to just run sprints, back, forth, back, forth. So try to make it somewhat baseball specific. When you're doing sprints, it's fine, we have to work on it. Let's have them work on their leads and take their first couple steps real hard to work on like they're stealing a base, right? Have them run the bases if you're outdoors or if you're indoors, try to have them run like they're going from first to second or first to third if you have enough space to make it simulate something baseball specific and what they're doing. You can do medicine balls, throws as you're doing workouts if you have that to work on the rotation of the swing, to work on the rotation of throwing the baseball, right? So a lot of these exercises can be done still baseball specific while getting the players in shape. Now, obviously, as you start to get older and the players become, you know, stronger and they're more baseball is a, is a big, big thing for them. You know, then you start to look a little bit different with weightlifting routines and all that. But for uh, for a lot of the indoor stuff, you can still do baseball specific workouts um, there. Uh, body weight stuff and all that is, is something that's great. But the most important thing and this is the last thing before we jump into the drills. The most important thing to do as you're going through um, a practice is when you finish up your practice, you have to recap your practice, right? You need to talk about what did we do today? What did we learn? Why did we do it? Why, why are we working on this? And how is this going to relay to what we're doing? Um, as a teacher, um, I used to teach history. And the question I would get asked after I taught about, you know, uh, the American Revolution is, why do I need to know this? How does this relate to me as a student right now? And I would have to explain that, right? Some of the stuff we would teach, I'd have to make up some reason on how it really tied, right? But here with our baseball and our softball, the drills that we just did, recap, why did we work on, on our ground balls, attacking the ground balls or working on a backhand? Well, last game we made some errors or last year we struggled on this or I see us a little slow attacking, attacking the ball. Or we're missing the strike zone, right? Recap what you did, explain why we're doing it 
and re and kind of have them tell you what they learned. We always ask when we finish, I need three people to tell me something they learned today that they didn't know, or they learned, you know, how to do it better. And this is going to force them to talk. It's going to force them to become a cohesive unit and collaborate together. And it's going to force that force them to grow. Right? This is where the growth is going to occur in a player, in a team, in a program, is recapping and having these discussions. Um, some of the best practices, the practices that I've had didn't take place on a field. It didn't take place in the gym. It took place in the bleachers talking about what we're doing, why we're doing it, and how we can improve. Um, I remember specific practices from just last year with my high school team that we were we were struggling. We were we won the first three games and lost the next five. And I'm like, what are we doing, right? And we had a little coming to moment where we just sat down and said, we're not focusing on this. We're being too lazy here. We need to really come together and do this. And that, that growth that we had as a team and really helped lead us to the conference championship that we won that year. So you know, your best, best practices can come from the conversations that you have while not practicing the skills itself. All right. So uh, hopefully that was beneficial. And like I said, I know every team, every program, everyone has different space, but just a little breakdown of how we have done things in our programs out here um, to divide up um, our indoor practices. So the next part that I'm going to go into here is um, different drills for different skill sets. I know that uh, there are some other speakers who have gone in, in the coming weeks who will be doing drills. Um, coming nights will be doing drills. I don't want to steal anyone's thunder here, but there's just are a few drills that you can do on a smaller space or at least indoors. Um, all of the videos that I have here are on our primetime baseball um, YouTube account, sorry. And uh, some, of the, some of the drills I have to upload today. So when we're done, I will. But um, definitely go through, give us a, a follow, a subscribe on there. Um, feel free to use all these videos. If you ever post them on social media, I would love to have you tag us in them. Just, it's, you know, social media is, it's a crazy place right now. Uh, for kids and for coaches to learn a lot of stuff. I've learned stuff on there. I share stuff on there. So I'll get all my social media account uh, handles out to you guys later. But all these drills that you'll see today will be on, on YouTube on our primetime baseball account for you to view. All right. So we have daily drills when I'm, when I'm indoors and outdoors with my teams that our players need to do every single day. So when they come in, it's, it's like clockwork. Right. They come in, we go through our warm up, we go through our stretching, our J bands, our plyos, and then we go into infield and outfield and catching and pitching daily drills and daily work. And what we're doing with these are they're basic drills that are geared towards plays that players will make in every single game. Right. So we're going to start with outfield. So um, this is this is Kyle. Kyle is a junior on my high school team. And even though we did this drill outside, um, these, it still can be done inside. So I'll go ahead and play it and then we'll talk about it. All right, so ground balls here. They're rolling the ground balls and uh, this player's rolling them to different sides, forcing Kyle to move, whether that be a ground ball right at him, a ground ball to his left or right side, um, you know, that he has to either get around, get his body around, um, you know, has to take a knee if it's right at him. He has to go and backhand, go with the spin. We work on all of those different routes that a ball may take him um, to really make sure that he's getting himself in the proper footwork, in the proper spots. And we try to make sure that we mix in every type of ball, regular ground balls, slow rollers, choppers. And if you notice, every time he goes to field the ball, they field it and we come up to our throwing position. Because what tends to happen if we don't come up to our throwing position, players are just going to field the ball and then just kind of get lazy, right? Field it. And then what we'll see is they'll make the air on a game. They won't come up and attack that ball hard. They'll just kind of field it like there. He just kind of lazy with it, right? He just fielded that ball and then he didn't come up to throw it. Here he comes up and there's his throwing position, right? So I'm just, it just went through, looped it through again, but just really focused on the footwork. Nice and easy drills. It's nothing too crazy. Um, but you know, players can roll this back and forth. So if you have four guys in a group, four girls in a group, here's two people rolling it back and forth, getting that, getting to work in. What we tend to do is we tend to do five of each. So five right at them, five to their left, five to their right, five choppers, five uh, where they have to do a come around and spin, five where they have to backhand. Um, but five is the number that we like to use. 
I'm an even number guy, but five tends to tends to work. All right. Oh, there we go. Same one. All right. Next drill. So obviously this one's going to depend on the height of your ceilings, but you don't have to throw it crazy high. This is um, it's a, a ball finding drill. So what's going to happen is let's get the sound. Go ahead and play here. All right, so what happens is the player is facing the opposite direction in his ready position. The guy will throw the ball up. And when the ball is at its highest point, the player, the throwing player will yell go. And go means turn around, look up, find the ball, and then camp yourself underneath go. it into the proper throwing position. Go. Now, ways to adjust this drill if you don't have high ceilings, right? is as soon as you let go of the ball, yell go. Oh. And the player has less time to react to the ball, but you can do that with any size, even just a gym. He's not throwing the ball up that high. So if you're indoors, unless you're in an office space, you should have enough room to do, to do this to some extent. And this is also, like I said, part of our daily work oh. that we do every day. Now, this one takes a little more room and I'm gonna show you indoors how I was able to do this here in a minute. But this is our um, our outfield drills that we do with shorter throws. They're routes. All right. And what happens is the player is going to point a direction, and the, when he points that direction, the player is going to run that. Uh, the uh, outfielder is going to run that direction. All right. So he pointed to the right. He ran to the right. Here he points to the left. He throws the ball. Outfielder's job is to get underneath it. Same thing, you could throw more of a line drive instead of a high pop-up. And here, this is a different drill. He points one way and then does a redirect. You can see him running. When we're outside, you can challenge it, go a little bit more. When you're inside, they may be more quick, tighter turns, but it's still footwork. It's still finding the ball. And that alone right there is better than nothing, right? Players need to pick up the ball out of the hand, which is just like picking the ball up off the bat. So this is one, yes, it'd be better to be done outside with more space, but here's an example of us doing, uh, I'm doing the exact same drill and I'm doing it indoors, all right? So here we go back. I wanna listen, listen here. I'm talking about this is what we call the open the gate drill. And this is how, how you walk through the drill, but how we can do it on an indoor space. So you can see this is prime time. It's our indoor space. Uh, this is the five cages and we have them opened up. So you can see how much space it uses, but it isn't too much. Open the gate drill. And what's going to happen is I'm going to start. I'm going to start with the baseball. All right. I'm going to start with my glove. I'm going to get in my ready position like I would in the infield, which is here. I don't have to have my hands out today for this. You just start here. Now I'm going to toss the ball to whoever is going to be throwing. It could be a brother, sister, or parent, friend, whatever. All right. As soon as the person I'm throwing to catches the ball, I'm going to open up the gate. For the first part of the drill, we're going to open up our glove side. If you're a lefty, you're going to open up with your right foot. If you're right, you're going to open your left foot. Okay, I'm going to open the gate, and I'm going to take off running this way. As I'm running, I'm keeping my eye on the ball. So the person is running. Okay? They're going to throw the ball. I'm going to turn around, set my feet, catch the ball. Now, how do you catch the ball? You want to catch the ball with whatever your throwing arm is. That foot and the leg is going to be back. So I'm a right-handed thrower. So once I get to position, I'm going to plant my right foot back. So I can catch it and use my momentum to come up for a throw. All right. So as you do it, you open the gate, run back, get there, get set, catch the ball, come up like you're gonna throw, and then just kind of throw it back. All right. So here's what it looks like. All right. I'm here in my position. I'm gonna toss the ball, catch it. I'm gonna open the gate. I'm gonna run, set my feet, come up ready to throw. Now you can see I didn't run very far. Right, I took maybe two or three steps and did the drill. Outside, yeah, let's push it. Let's run a lot. But if we're indoors or we don't have a lot of space, this doesn't have to be used. Very, You don't have to run very far. Right, It's all about getting your feet moving, picking up the ball out of the hand, and getting set up. All right, So don't think that you have to have this massive amount of space. And if you do, hey, let's push a little bit. Let's take advantage. But if you don't, you can see that you can do the same drill with not a lot of space. Now, this is the quarterback drill. This is the one that we saw where you're going to kind of zigzag. We'll go ahead and show that. Same thing. You don't need too much space. It's all about picking up the ball out of the hand and getting the correct footwork. Start here. 
Same thing. I'm going to toss the ball. As soon as the person catches it, I'm going to open the gate. Now, when I open the gate, I run on my 45 degree angle over here. I'm going to be running this way. I'm watching my target, which is the baseball. As soon as the person who has the baseball gives me a pump fake, they're going to fake throw. I'm going to turn and run on an angle this way, and then I'm going to catch the ball here. Okay? This is called our quarterback drill. All right? People throwing, you get to relive your glory days, get that quarterback action going. For us, the ball player catching the ball, we're like almost like a wide receiver. All right, now it's important. There are two ways that you can turn. As you're running this way, you can turn this way, which it's good because it keeps your eye on the ball the whole time. The downfall with turning that way is you have to have really good feet. And if your footwork's not there, you're going to trip and fall. All right, the other uh, version is as you're running this way, do a quick turn and I'm locating the ball. I know some people are going to say, well, you don't want to take your eye off the ball. We agree. But we're athletes, we're baseball players. We're able to make that quick adjustment and find the ball real quick. All right, we're going to have to be able to do that. There's going to be times in the outfield, the ball is safe. We're going to be running one way. The wind's going to blow it. Sun's going to be in our eyes. We're going to be running all over the place. All right, so here's how the drill works. Quarterback drill, all right? Here we go. I start here. I toss it. I'm going to run this way. As soon as I see the pump fake, I'm going to run, catch the ball, set my feet, come up for a fake throw. All right, so like I said, you saw it. Not a lot of space. I think I took two or three steps going once I opened the gate. And then as soon as I got the pump fake, I took another two or three steps and caught the ball. Nothing too crazy. Um, as I explained in this video, there's two ways to turn. Some people are going to say, coach, you shouldn't turn your back to the ball. All right. But these younger kids, some of the younger players or players who aren't as developed yet, they're not able to physically make that turn without tripping, falling over their feet. All right. So that's why we kind of say, hey, look, we're going to leave it up to you to see which one you're more comfortable with because you're going to have to react to be able to move your – seeing the ball for a second and not seeing the ball for a second. It's going to happen even if you turn the, the way without turning your whole body in, or with keeping your eye on the ball the whole time, you're still going to have reasons you may not be able to see the ball. So um, good drill to do. You can open the gate both ways. It's not just to your glove side. You, uh, we work on the left side, the right side, opening the gate, and this drill with both sides. So. Um, Another drill, I don't have it on here. I do want to show you. Um, we, you'll see throughout this tonight, uh, we're going to do a lot of wall ball drills. Um, you cannot utilize a wall enough, all right? So we'll stop right here. You can't utilize the wall enough. So right here, we have a net um, back here. But what we'll do is we'll prop open that net. And a lot of the times, um, we'll throw the ball off the wall, and we'll do drills where we'll come charge the ball that's hit out the wall and pretend it's like a ground ball or a line drive hit out to us in the outfield. And you have to come attack the ball and come up throw a throw in position, just like we did in the first drill. And that's where players can do that on their own without a coach. They don't have to have a coach there. So in case you're short staffed or you don't have a lot of coaches with you, that's a drill that you can do by just simply having a ball and a wall. All right. So you'll see, we'll do drills with infield and catching tonight with the same thing. So I know Will uh, Lintern is speaking on catching, so I'm gonna I'm gonna jump over a few of these drills tonight because I don't want to do too much uh, steal of thunder because Will's a great dude and I know he's he's got some solid stuff for you all coming up. But there are some ones that um, uh, I have on here. Coach Brissett um, gave me a lot of some really good drills too that he does with our catchers. He does all of our catching stuff. I won't even lie and pretend that I know that I'm a catcher because I'm not, but um, I do help out and do a lot of these drills, and you'll see. These are a lot of these catching drills are drills that we can do in a tiny space. Um, so nothing too crazy. I'm going to walk, go through these. Um, just kind of watch, right? These are catcher daily drills. Just work on simple receiving. Some uh, the knee up or knee down is a big, big topic in baseball right now, but we like to keep our players up as much as possible. Um, but just nice and easy tosses, mixing up inside, outside, high, low. Um, really just kind of getting our players loose and getting them warm up this is the first thing our catchers do working on receiving the ball you don't need a lot of space for this you can be as close or as far away as you want but it's all about the catcher picking up the ball receiving the ball with his thumb down um, and not stabbing at the ball we do that we did it with the glove um, without the glove now we do the same thing with the glove just simple receiving catching the ball nice and easy nice and relaxed um, Good way to get loose, a good way to get warmed up, especially in a super tiny space. And it's nice because catchers don't have to take up too much space for a lot of their early work. 
Here we're doing a plyo ball receiving drill. So this is uh, Jacob. Jacob is a, uh, a college, he plays college baseball at Davidson University, Division I school in North Carolina. Um, they get started here this weekend. But here you can see he's having balls, uh, the plyo balls, the drive on balls tossed at him. And he's just working on the same thing, receiving. But instead of a baseball, it's a, a heavier ball. So it's causing resistance, right? But he's still doing the same thing, working on his receiving. Here you can see, look, at he's a college athlete missing the ball. It happens. We'll throw tennis balls, racket balls, um, squishy balls, all different things at him to try to mix up the, the catching of the ball, but also to challenge our players uh, to just be able to, to be athletes. This is part of our daily drills as well. Uh, next, we're going to go into the blocking, also part of our daily drills. The catchers are blocking. Nice, easy, nice, easy balls thrown right in front. They're working on just blocking, right? They're not going after the balls right now, just blocking it, trying to keep it in front of them, not trying to go after the ball and get it, pick it up to throw. They're just blocking the ball. Um, and you can see all these drills so far we've done, we've done in like the free throw lane of a basketball court, right? We've done off the side of a, of, uh, of a court or in the corner of a gym. Catchers need the littlest amount of space out of any position to do the work that they need to do. And yet, in my opinion, I think the catcher is the most important position on the field uh, because they are leading that team. Um, and you can see all of these drills, really, it's just two people doing it, right? Um, this is a drill that players can do, catchers can do solo, same thing, in a corner of a gym, uh, in a classroom setting even. But here, it's a three ball drill. Catcher's going through, working on whatever the coach, I think here, in here. I call out a position. Nope. Got a drill wrong. Here, I'm not calling out. I have, you're working on each one. Just rotating ball to ball, working on blocking right in front, working on blocking the first base side, third base side. Um, you know, just getting your blocking down. And this is getting your feet uh, loose, getting your body loose. The next one is it is the vocal, the verbal drill. So you'll hear here as we're going through the drill. First base. I call the base, the position he blocks the right side. Third base. Same thing. Don't need space. Third base. Mix up your calls. Keep them on their toes. Pitcher. Never let them, never let the player get comfortable. And as we're doing a lot of these drills, our job as a coach is to keep our players uncomfortable while being comfortable, right? That's kind of like a Yogi Berra saying, it doesn't make any sense, but it does, right? We want our players to be uncomfortable so that they don't get too comfortable and become relaxed, right? Because if you're so comfortable that you feel so, so confident that I've got this and you're nice and chill and relaxed, the next thing that happens is you miss it. You take the play a little bit lighter than you should, and you make an easy mistake, and the error occurs. And we really talked about that a lot last week. All right, so keep in, mix it up. First keep base. their, keep their, their uh, mind never thinking that the same thing's happening. These are some wall ball receiving drills. Same thing, you're just using a, a baseball, tennis ball, and a wall. Okay, so you'll see here. All, um, here, this is Tommy. Tommy's just catching the ball off the wall. I'm standing right behind him. And I just throw the ball, it hits off the wall, one hops, and he catches it. Works on framing it, keeping it, holding the glove, sticking it. But you can see, just nice, easy one hops. Not challenging, not doing anything too much. I can throw it harder. I can throw it softer. I can move him up closer up into this area up here. Uh, I can move him further back. But all that's to help with the reaction. But once again, tiny space. You don't need a lot. Now we're doing the same drill, but blocking. All right, so nice off the wall drill, blocking the ball. See, I'm moving, I can move him side to side. I can have him go just right in front. And the goal is to block it, and then he just tosses right behind me. Right, there's no, we're not going fast. We're not speeding through this. It's just nice and relaxed, really focused on our fundamentals, really making sure that, that our catchers and here Tommy is, is focused on his job. And his job is to block the ball as soon as, as, as soon as he gets a read off of the wall. Now here we start to add a twist to it. 
now we're warmed up. Now we're loose. Our hands are good. Our, our legs feel good. We're loose there. We're going to, we're going to move on to the next part and that's going to be reverse receivers. All right. So the catcher is going to face the thrower. As soon as the thrower releases the ball, he's going to jump, turn around and get into his catching position. Now he can get a little bit lower here, but I can move Tommy forward and make it tougher. I can move him back and make it even easier. I can throw it harder or softer, and that will challenge Tommy in different levels. So you see he missed that last one, right? He didn't get himself in position. He got a little lazy. I like to show him when he misses it. Watch this one. He doesn't get in position in time. Gets a little lazy, doesn't catch it. Always end with a good one. All right, so that's wall ball reverses. Work on um, a quick reaction, right? Now we're training his eyes and the vision instead of just his hand-eye coordination of catching it. It's also picking up the ball off the wall, making a decision of what he has to do with it. And we're going to do the same thing here, but with blocking. So he's going to turn around, find the ball, and he has to block it. And I can challenge Tommy, like I said, same ways. Moving him side to side, throwing a harder, softer whatever I need to do based on, based on the type of player that he is or is trying to be. Uh, this is another, another drill. It's the no hands block, excuse me, no hands blocking drill. Back to Jacob here. This is one of Coach Brissett's favorites. So here, hands behind, really focused on making sure he gets his body squared up to the ball. All right, one more time. Once again, no space needed. I can't emphasize that enough. For our catchers, you do not need a lot of space. And there's all these drills are things that we need our catchers to do. They have to receive the ball to get those strike calls um, and to be able to throw runners out when they steal. We have to be able to block a ball in the dirt to make sure we don't give up as many extra bases. These are super important things that our catchers have to do. Right? And this is the next one. This is the same thing. doesn't use a lot of space, but it's making our catchers be athletic. They're going to block the ball and find the ball, get up to our throwing position. Block the ball, up, find, get ready to throw. Oh, there you go, see? Tommy, one thing, our catcher's gonna pick up the ball and any, our infielders, outfielders too, if that ball is still moving, we've gotta be able to use our two hands. We're not Tucker Barnhart or Pudge Rodriguez or any of those guys that we can, or shoot Yadier Molina, that guy's unreal. We're not that good that we can just pick it up bare hand every single time. When we go to pick up that ball, if it's still moving, use our glove and our hand, gather that ball to make a throw. All right. Once we get better and a little bit, a little bit more uh, on those pro ball, pro guys levels, we can do some of that different stuff, but continue to hone in and focus on the fundamentals. Uh, this is a block and find. It's a rapid fire drill. So you're going to see he blocks, gets up, blocks, gets up blocks, gets up, finds the ball, All right? I like to put um, kind of multiple components together. So we're working on being quick, a lot of reps. So he's working on his block, block, block. And then the final one, that third one, he blocked, blocks the ball and finds it. Right, any way to add multiple components of drills together? There's always ways to help kind of push our players. So that's a little cardio, get a little condition in there. And our catchers are working hard. Hardest workers on the field. We got to make sure that they're in good shape to be able to stand, uh, squat back there for those, those seven or nine innings. I think this is the last one that we work on in our daily work and our blocking here is our side to side blocking. All right. I'm telling them right now where I'm throwing it. I'm not trying to trick them. We're going side to side, left side, right side, left side, right side. And then we add middle. Sorry. Left side, right side, middle. All right, so working side to side blocking, right? No pitcher ever throws a perfect ball in the dirt every time. So we'll go left and right, back and forth with the blocking. Here, this drill is left side, right side, middle, and then a receive. All right. All right, so those are all drills, like I said, little, no space get a lot of work in that is needed for our catchers. Uh, and and they can they don't have to do all of those in the same day. 
Now, you don't have to do those, all those in the same practice. You can take a few of them here and there. You can work one day all on receiving and do those five different receiving drills. You can do one day of all blocking and work on all of that, right? So there's ways to do it. Um, this is a replace drill. So this is really to work on the transition from catching the ball to our transition to throwing. Okay, so what Tommy has is in his hand, he's going to have a towel. And this is in our pitching area. You can see uh, Brissett's Great Britain national team jersey up there. So it's kind of cool. We have that all over, all over the facility here. But what you're going to see is Tommy's going to have a towel in his hand. He's going to receive the baseball in his left hand. He's going to replace the ball and the towel. He's going to switch them. So the towel starts in his throwing hand, and it's going to end in his glove hand. So I'll go ahead and watch it through. All right, watch him switch the towel to there, and he switches the ball. This is working on hand-eye coordination. This is working on the feel of the transition, All right? And I'm going to show from a different angle, so you can see from a front angle here of what that drill looks like. He's in his catcher position, catches the ball, transit, uh, transitions over. All right, I'll show it one more time. This is a cool drill. I really like this one. Same thing. We can do this in the hallway of a school. Um, a lot of these you could. You can even do this kind of while you're waiting to, to get into your space. All right. And I believe this is the last one we have here. Yep. The last catching one I've got here. All right. Short hops. Using the plyo balls or the baseballs, sorry. Working on short hops, scooping the ball up. Nice, easy drill to work on, little to no space, um, but it's really working on those those picks that catchers ought to make on those low on those low pitches, and really working on staying in our our catching position to do this at the same time. Nice, easy picks, nice, easy scoops here from Jacob. All right, so these are infield drills. Uh, sorry, those are the catchers drills. So we've done our outfield drills, catching drills. Now we're going to jump into some infield drills. And for those who were with me last week. Um, I have a ton, a ton of infield drills that we went over, some really good ones. Um, but I, I see we have a lot, of, a lot of new people who were not here last week, so I do have um, some of those on here as well. So, um, you know, some repeats so people, people can see what we have. Um, but I'll go ahead and go, go through these drills, and, and we'll talk about them as we go, what we've been doing. So um, our infield daily work, what we're going to do is our players here, uh, this is Ryan. Ryan's going to um, play next year at Bucknell in the Division One school in Pennsylvania. So here, Ryan's doing our infield daily work. We work on ground balls from our knees to start, fielding the ball right in front of us. We go the same transition every time. One hand out front, two hands out front. Then we go glove side, fielding the ball out front with his glove side. And then we go backhand. All right, so as we're going through, Backhand is the hardest play for an infielder to make. See that? Ryan had four ground balls. He missed two, two of the five he missed. All right, this is a Division I college-bound player. All right, this guy throws 92, 93 miles an hour. It throws smoke. All right, but here you can see nice, easy ground balls out front. Not trying to push them. Not trying to drive them crazy. Not trying to make these plays unbearable. Just nice, easy one hops. It's for him to get feel. For him to watch that ball in. For him to, to um, get good reads on it. Here he's backhanded it. See? Just getting his hands uh, awake, his eyes awake, getting that coordination, and just working on some of the easier stuff of the of the game. This translation translates next into the same drill, but with our glove. So here we're doing it with our glove out front, one hand, out front, two hands. See, I'm going a little bit quicker with him here, challenging Ryan a little bit. All right, we've already gone through this one once or twice with just regular, nice and easy ground balls. Now I'll speed it up a little bit on. Out front, one hand. Out front, two hands. All right? Nice nice rhythm going. Then we go to glove side and backhand. Change the speeds. Go fast. Go slow. You know, do a little bit of both. Go slow and then speed it up. Or go fast and then slow it down. The different speeds, like we talked about with the catching, with the outfield, the different speeds, the changing things up is going to force the player to have to refocus. All right? That's what we want. We want them to have to stay focused the entirety of that drill. This drill is only 15 seconds, right? But that's the intention span that we're gonna have them for. Next, we go through the same progression. And by the way, just so you know, when 
Um, Colin, I told Colin he can share all this stuff. Um, let you guys see it. What I have here on the writing before it's explaining the drill. So it's explaining what I'm going over um, with it, with you all in the video. So uh, just for time's sake, so I make sure to show get everything in today. I'm just skipping over the the words I have written out, but uh, so you're not missing anything here. But that's what the the video is describing. So we're doing the same drills here, right? We're fielding the ball out front, one hand out front, two hands, glove side and backhand. And he's just tossing the ball next to him. He could even throw it back to me if he wants. But we always start bare hand and then move our way up to glove, um, to using the glove. Sometimes we'll go bare hand, then we'll go to the training gloves or the paddles if we have those with us, and then we'll go into a regular glove. But it's kind of like um, I talked about last week a lot, the building, the foundation of a house, right? You have to have a solid foundation in order to build a house. If we don't have a solid infield foundation, we can't be a solid infielder and defender. So we work on the fundamentals of no hand, of no, no glove to a training or mini glove or paddle up to a game situation glove. Training the body, warming the body up for all scenarios. And here we are again now, the standing drill with the glove. One hand, two hands, glove side and backhand. All right, and then the final part of our, of our daily drills with these are our, uh, our roll throughs. So we're gonna go through an actual ground ball where I'm just gonna roll it right at him. He's gonna field the ball, come up to our throwing position. I'll go through it about three or four times. The first time through will be nice and slow, nice and easy. Then the second time or third time, I'll start to speed it up. So here you can see he's moving pretty quick, but that's because we've gone through our warmups. We've gone through and he's, I'm making this as game-like as possible. So you can see he's fielding it out front and then glove hand and now he's backhanding the ball, okay? Once again, not a lot of space. So if to kind of recap, if you think of three stations and let's say you take out all of your hitters right now, you have one group of outfielders using, let's say the main part of the gym. Let's say you have a, a gym, a basketball, a volleyball court, whatever. The main part of the gym is going to be your, your outfielders. They're moving around a little bit more. On the corners, you can put your catchers. On the other ends, you can have, or the other baselines, you can have your infielders. They're not going to hit each other. They're not going to run into each other. And you have three groups spaced out right there. And your players can all be interchangeable in there. Not everybody may be a catcher, and so maybe you can adjust it there, but your players can move their way through those three stations by doing these three drills in 15 minutes, and you just got each player at each position a minimal of 100 to 125 reps at that skill set. That's unreal, and, and that, that is just going to show so much when you're able to move outside on a regular basis to get to practices and games outside. So we'll go ahead and watch this video. It's a little one, but it's about the wall drill. Same thing. I told you we're going to do a lot of wall drill stuff with every position. Oh. We're going to be doing it two different ways. We're going to be using with the glove and without the glove. So I'm going to start without the glove for the first part of the drill. Right? So I've got my wall here that I'm doing my ball, ground balls with. And I got my baseball. I'm going to get myself into my infield stance. My feet are shoulder width apart, knees bent. All I'm going to do is throw the ball at the wall. I'm going to be fielded the first time with my bare hand on my glove hand. So I'm a right-handed thrower. I feel with this hand. So that's the hand that I'm going to field the ball for. I'm going to field the ball out front. Now notice my head. I'm looking right down at the baseball. I field the ball out in front of my body, not the back of my stance. Okay? Nice little ground ball right out in front. Okay? This is a good warm-up. Get my sleeves. And you can see, depending how you fill the ball at the wall, sometimes it becomes a slow roller. Sometimes it can come hard. That's up to you how hard you feel the ball at the wall. After we field one hand, we're going to go two hands, okay? With no gloves still. Right out the front, two hands. No so you can see we're doing the same thing we just did. Um, we're doing our ground balls out front, glove with, with and without a glove, one hand, two hands, glove side and back hand, all right? Using the wall, you're just throwing it to yourself. Well, you can also do another, another uh, branch off of this, just have a partner stand behind you, like the catching drills we were doing and have the partner throw the ball off the wall to you. And okay? there's different ways to do all of these drills. They can uh, accommodate and reach out to a lot of different skill sets, but a lot of it, you can see little to no space is being used 
And a lot of it you can do with or without a coach, as long as you're teaching them the right way from the beginning. The purpose of it is reacting to how the ball's set up. The so the next one here, this is the short hop drill. I like this drill because it doesn't take space at all. You're literally just standing by yourself or kneeling by yourself, but it works on your hands and how they're attacking the ground ball on a short hop, or you can work on it for scoops for first baseman catchers or even infielders receiving a, a throw down from a base or from a, from the outfield. The infielder outfield, this is a drill that's going to be beneficial for you. All right? These drills are all designed to push you to game life situations. Right? So we know that we're not playing games right now and not even able to practice. So doing stuff on your own is how you're going to get yourself better and eventually get your team better. Fast forward a little bit. You all know when you play in games that when it got to react to it. And first, I'm going to start off here on my knees without my glove. All right, I'm going to be right here in this position. What I'm going to do is I'm going to throw the ball up in the air. I'm going to let it bounce. And as soon as it bounces, I'm going to try and catch it right off the bounce as close to the ground as I can. Okay, so I'm going to throw it up. I'm going to try to get it very good. as close as I can. I'll turn on this angle so you can see a little bit better. I'll throw it up. I try to get it as soon as it hits the ground. Make sure it bounces. All right. So, something like so one thing to sure focus on when you go to field this ball. Is making sure that you're keeping it. I was trying to pause it on the right spot, but making sure that you're keeping that ball as soon as you field it, not coming up and not slinging your hands too much. Try to keep it as low to the ground as you can when you catch it. Not too slow. Make sure it bounces. All right. So something like a tennis ball or a racket ball, a cross ball, it might not slip it more, baseball. See a net and you can throw it as high as you want. Just try to get it and see. I never messed up. We're going to make mistakes with that. The point is to make sure we're going game speed as quick as we can. And so after we've done that with the bare hand, we're going to grab our glove and do the same thing. All right, pull the ball up. So remember, I'm with and without the glove, the right? All these drills are with and without the glove. The next thing that we're going to do with it is as you're standing up, you're doing the same thing. And now you're going to start to add in your footwork, okay? This is where you start to add your footwork of fielding the ball on the hop and coming up to your throwing position. Just standing up. This one's going to be a little bit tougher and add a little more movement. You're going to throw the ball in the air. You're going to let it bounce once. And then right when it hits its second bounce, that's when we're going to try to field it. All right, so you throw it up. One, second bounce, field it. Notice how my feet were moving after I field the ball. One, second bounce, ready to roll. You want to make sure as you're fielding that ball, you're getting your feet moving towards your throwing target. You can throw it as high as you want. All right? Or you can keep it nice and well. All right, so drills right there. You can use baseball, softball. It might not bounce if you're on a basketball court, so maybe a tennis ball or a racquetball or something. Um, but just getting that ball to bounce a little bit off, and then you can attack it. You can do that on, on your knees or while standing. This drill. All right, the next one here, this is a zigzag cone drill. So um, once again, right, so for this drill, it doesn't take a lot of space. Um, but what you're going to do is you're going to work on doing a, a shuffle. I call it a basketball shuffle from one side over to the cone. As soon as you hit the cone, you're going to sprint over to field the other ball or to field the baseball, get it up to your throwing position. And then you're going to repeat. So this is nice for, for group work. Um, you know, have how you can have two people go. As soon as the person fields the ball, they either toss it to the next person to put back there or let one person go all the way through the drill and then go ahead and reload. But this is a good little conditioning. It's good to, uh, to focus on the fundamentals of staying low to field the ground ball and to come up to our throwing position. I'm going to sprint over to this ball, pick up the ball like on the left side like we just worked on in the video, and go up to our throwing position. All right? So come here. I'm going to pick it up and get ready to throw. All right? Put the ball down here. Do the same thing. We're going to shuffle over, get to the cone, sprint, pick it up, ready position, get ready to throw. All right, so here you can see that's five balls. That's it, but that's five extra reps that they're getting working as close to game speed as we can. All right, and that's something I've said a lot tonight, and I'm gonna I'm gonna always kind of emphasize that we need to make our practices, whether they're indoors or outdoors, as close to game speed as possible. And you can't have this drill go on for ten baseballs because by the fourth or fifth or sixth ball, they're gonna be tired. All right. So then we're just taking bad reps and not going at it, gain speed. So having four or five max, and they're not going into that, that higher than five range really is going to help our players be able to give max effort before they switch, catch their breath, and then they come back and do it again.
All right. So that's uh, that's another another drill, the zigzag cone drill um, that we're that we're able to do to hey guys, Coach here. kind of get our so players. Uh, the drill for this week. It's a... There we go. Sorry to to kind of get our players trying some trying some new drills uh, to to really stay focused on you know getting a lot of work done on a smaller space. So those are some infield drills. Um, you know, just some simple ones, but once again, not a lot of space is being used. Now, the final part I have uh, here is our pitching drills. Now, um, you know, I didn't want to go too much into pitching mechanics or anything like that. Um, one of the things that I'm going to show you here are the plyo drills that we use. Um, if you follow, you know, driveline or you follow a lot of them, uh, these throwing programs that do a lot of these plyo ball drills, that's what I'm showing you here tonight. Um, how our pitchers get loose, but also how all of our players get loose going through different throwing motions. Um, here, this is, uh, you can see the plyo balls, the rubber balls filled with different uh, sand on the inside. These are called reverse throws, right? And here, this is our pitching coach, um, Chris Rooney. And Chris here is just working, getting his body loose, um, doing his reverse throws. And this is part of our warm up. But uh, I put it with the pitching drills because all of our pitchers have to do this as part of their warm up before they go into their actual pitching mechanics. But this is just some re uh, reverse throws. Here we go into what we call um, pivots. And all we're throwing them into a wall, that's a plyo wall for us, but you guys can throw it into a padded wall or um, really any brick wall, cement wall doesn't really matter. Um, the brick wall will break these over time a lot faster. So just be, be cautious of that. But all of these are simulating pitching mechanics, simulating throws, and obviously Chris is a lefty pitcher here but simulating throws that our pitchers will do and it's help help uh, focus on building the, the muscles and teaching the muscle memory to our pitchers, uh, but also help build the shoulder strength and mobility in their shoulders, which is why it's beneficial. Like I said, not just for pitchers, but for all players. So I get I probably should have labeled this as throwing instead of pitching, but this is a, a great group that you can have when going through a lot of your infield or just going through a lot of your, uh, your stations. Right, these are walking windups. He's walking into his throws. And even though he's getting into a pitching position, it doesn't mean it has to be pitching specific. All right, two more here for you. Here, same thing. This is a recovery for his shoulder. We get done throwing, working on just he's tossing the ball up. Go back here, tossing the ball up, catching it right as it starts to make its way down. It's helping just build his shoulders up, getting getting a little stronger, getting a little more mobility and flexibility in there. And then the final one that we'll show here is just laying on the ground here. Same exact same thing he was just doing, but now he's on his side. And we'll do this for both arms. We'll do both of those for both arms. Even though you're only throwing with, with your throwing arm, it's great to have both in there because otherwise our arms will tend to get lopsided. All right. And I know I'm running out of time here, and I don't want to take up too much of your evening this Wednesday night. But um, this is something I did last, and I thought it was, it was one of the, the things I'll be speaking in, uh, it seems like, years from now, because it is, but I guess, but. 2025, um, the ABCA, it's the American Baseball Coaches Association, they'll be doing a convention. They do it every year in January all over the U.S., and they'll be doing it here in Washington, D.C., and um, they have asked me to speak on this part right here on uh, infield play, but specifically the forgotten components of infield play, and it's something I, I had made up um, this past year when I was kind of reflecting on my coaching. So I thought about things that I do well and things I don't do well. And then I thought about things my teams do well, all of them, and don't do well. And I found that as a, as a coach and as a coaching staff, we loved to get mad at our players for making errors and making mistakes on plays, some of them routine. And then I thought about it. I'm like, I've never taught that. Excuse me. Or I don't work on it. All right, so I'm getting mad at players for making mistakes, and then I realize I don't actually work on these components of the infield game. And a lot of it's geared towards first base, 
That's what I played, but that's a lot of, that's a position that tends to get zero skill work because a lot of people believe your job's a first baseman, just catch the ball. And that's true. The job of the first baseman is to catch the ball thrown to them with their foot on the base. But there's a lot more that goes into it because no team ever has every infielder throw a perfect throw to the first baseman that they never have to move for. And you can all attest to every game that's never happened. All right, so um, we're going to go through a couple of these and then uh, we'll go ahead and wrap it up. I'll do a little Q&A here. But um, this drill right here is called the recovery drill. And this is working on recovering from a ground ball that you missed. Every game, there's a ground ball miss for our youth teams, either a bobble or whatever. And what this drill is, is I'm just going to roll a ground ball here to Ryan. He's going to purposely miss the ball. He's either going to hit it with his glove, the backside of his glove, and then go and recover to make a play, or his glove's going to be open. He's going to bat the ball and go get it and make a play. So we'll go ahead and watch it. Get my head out of the way here. See there, he goes to field the ball, has his open glove. He bats it away, recovers, fields it. All right. Now, this one, he's using the backside of his glove. All right. So he's going to literally hit that ball with the backside of his glove and then stay with the ball and make a play. And you can mix in choppers, ground balls right at him, make them move a little bit. But this is working on that bottle, right? Every ground ball is not perfect. Every ground ball, uh, they don't field the ball perfectly. So this is showing how to recover from a missed or misread or badly played ground ball or just a ball that takes a hop on you. And it happens. So recovery drill, showing how to recover from those ground ball misses. Um, so we talked about daily work, right? Our, all our infielders have daily work. As a former first baseman, my first baseman have extra daily work. They do this either before or after practice. They don't have an option. It's a must. And it's working on scoops. And I'll play it and talk. They literally just take a knee and they work on one hops, long and short hops right in front of them. They work on fielding at glove side and they work on fielding at backhand. Right? Nice, easy scoops. They're not, I'm not trying to make them miss. I'm not trying to throw the ball as hard as I can. You see, it's nice and easy, nothing too challenging. And I go right at them five and five, and then I'll rotate, backhand, glove side, backhand, glove side. Another component I'll do with this as I'm going through is I won't tell them where I'm throwing it. I'll maybe back up a little bit to give them more room, but I'll just throw it to either backhand or glove side and make him work, make him read the ball. You can do this with or without the glove. Um, the backhand is going to be a lot tougher for them to do, but it's still something you can do. I like to just have them do it with the glove. All right, so that's our scoop drill. Um, it's part of our infield dailies for our first baseman. Just simple scoops because first baseman have to be able to scoop the ball, but not many times they get the opportunity to work on it unless it's an actual bad throw. Um, this next part, the this next part is probably what I feel is the most important thing as an infielder or as a coach who's teaching infield that I hope you take from this presentation tonight. And that is the footwork around a first, being a first baseman and teaching how to be a first baseman. So um, I did lie. I told Colin I was going to have a, a diagram of a base and kind of how I do this. But first base is divided up into thirds, right? If you're thinking of a base, home plate is on this side. Second base is over here. It's broken up into thirds. The left side of the base is that third is anytime a ground ball is hit to third base or the pitcher, the first baseman is going to have their foot on this third of the base to receive the ball. If the ball is hit to shortstop, right, the first baseman is going to have their foot lined up to catch the ball with their foot in the middle of the base. If the ball is hit to the second baseman, they're going to be on this far third over here fielding the ball um on that right side all right so we're going to go through and as they that's that's um the footwork they're going to do i'm going to go through and you can kind of see some drills and how we're going to do this how to work on the footwork because when you're running to first base and the ball hit, you're not looking at the base and trying to see where you should stand it's all about feel it's all about visualizing in your head where that is and once again this takes zero space to do so ryan here is going to be lined up on the base and i'm going to point a direction and whatever direction I point, 
Ryan is going to go to that base, that direction to catch the ball. So here, that's a ball hit to second base. This is a ball hit to shortstop. This is a ball hit to third base. And you can see he's moving his feet and adjusting his feet based on where the ball is, based on where I'm pointing. So yep, yeah, third base point, he goes. Third, second base point, he goes. Okay, so that's this drill is the pointing visualization drill. Now the next one, his eyes are gonna be closed. And I'm gonna call out a base and Ryan's gonna have to move his feet to that base. Third base. Second base. You can watch his feet. Third base. He's getting all the way over. Second base. Third stop. Third base. All right, he's not looking at his feet. He's listening to my call on what base I call, and then he's adjusting his feet based on that. Now here we do the same thing with his eyes open. Second base. And we go a little faster. Third base. Second base. Notice mixing it up. Third base. Second base. Short stop. Second base. All right. So same thing. Just vocal. His eyes are open. He's what he can see, but he is reacting to the base based on what I say. Now the final one is chaos. And this one's a little tough to explain. But what I'm going to do as a coach is I'm going to tell Ryan, we're either going off of my pointing cues or my verbal cues. And whatever we agree on is what Ryan's going to do. So if I say we're going to go whichever way I point, that's Ryan's job. The first baseman's job is to go off that. I'm going to try and trick him by also saying a verbal cue. And I'm going to try to get Ryan to mess up. His job is to listen and, uh, and focus on whatever it is that we agree. So let's watch it here. He does a good job. This is the second take. He messed up on the first take. No. Second base. Short stop. Second base. Third base. Short stop. Third base. Second base. Yeah. All right. So he was going by my verbal cues. Wherever I was saying, Ryan was going. He was ignoring my point. He was going based on where I was visual, um, based on where I was vocally saying. So we'll do it one more time. This really, this is this is kind of a higher level one for uh, some of your top teams uh, or more advanced players. This is how you can really challenge them physically and mentally. No. Second base. Short stop. Second base. Third base. Short stop. Third base. Second base. All right, so that's what I call our chaos drill. And these are all visualizations. Same thing, like I said, a hallway, a classroom. You don't need a lot of space for this, right? A corner of a gym. So nothing crazy. So that is, that is my presentation I have for everyone. I have some shout outs here. Uh, just some people to thank, um, you know, in my, my baseball career, uh, coaching and playing, who've helped me uh, get to where I am and, and to be, you know, where, where I am confident and comfortable in teaching this because I'm a, I'm a student of the game. I'm constantly learning, um, going to the clinics and camps and listening to people talk. And uh, because like I said at the beginning, you cannot learn enough about this game. And the way the game is changing, getting a lot more analytical, a lot more visual, a lot more virtual with phones and iPads and all that stuff, the game is constantly changing. And if you stop learning, you're going to fall behind. Um, so I have my former college coaches, Ryan Kelly, Jay Alexander, Logan Hughes, uh, all the primetime parents and my Yorktown parents and families who, uh, you know, are constantly coming to watch, uh, watch us do our thing, but also learn and grow from us. And then my family, um, my wife, and my, my parents, uh, my sister, all my, all my family who supported me along the years. Um, last thing I have here, uh, just a thank you for, for the opportunity to speak with you all tonight. Um, you know, baseball season's right around the corner. We'll be in softball. We'll be out on the fields in no time um, playing. But, you know, for the, this spring season where the weather's so unpredictable and you may be inside a little bit more still, uh, hopefully these drills you learned tonight will help you. I have my email up here. Please, 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 any questions you have, ask me. Um, don't hesitate. Email. I'll answer them all. I love to talk baseball. I have my personal and uh, the business Instagram and Twitter. Um, Chris Brissett and I put stuff up all the time, uh, content, skills, drills, um, different things that we do. Um, so, you know, 
definitely uh, give us a follow just so you can learn more and uh, we can connect because like I said, I love, love learning more about the game. So um, that's all I have for you all tonight. I hope it was something you can take with you, even if it's just one thing. Um, I will, I will turn it back to Colin, but I am definitely here to answer any questions or comments or anything that you all have on the, on the mass amount of information I threw out to you all tonight. So, uh, Colin, I'll go ahead and send it back to you. Thank you, John. Thank you for another great presentation. Um, I hope everybody's learned a lot or, or has, there's a lot to take in, as John said. Um, are there any questions for John right now um, that people want to, to put up in the chat? Uh, and we can have a look at that and let John answer now. Um, there might be questions going forward that you might think of later on tonight or tomorrow, whatever the case is. Feel free to email John directly or email myself and I'll get hold of John um, to get some answers, whatever the case is. But uh, if you've got it there now, any questions from anybody? Got a sharp bunch out there tonight, John. No worries at all. Um, like you said, I am, um, you know, I'm, uh, I'm fortunate to be able to, to have the opportunity to, to talk to you all. And there's, there's, you know, a lot of drills. I threw a lot at you on a, at a quick time tonight, but hopefully some of these things were, um, you know, beneficial and things that you can take back to your program and to your teams and to your players to help them grow and get better. And um, definitely don't hesitate to reach out, like I said, with any questions and, and hit me up later if you want to. Perfect. Well, we'll take it that there's nothing for now, John. So, uh, everybody, thank you for giving up your time to allow John to come and um, chat with us. Um, we really did appreciate the last two weeks of your time, John. We have learned a lot. There's a lot more we can learn from somebody like yourself. Um, and uh, from a BSUK perspective, hope we, we can stay in touch as, as much as we can, um, chat as much as we can, pick your brain when needed. Um, and um, yeah, build a, build a long rapport between ourselves in, in, in the UK and, and prime time baseball. Um, I see there's a couple of things there in the chat. I'm just going to go and have a look quickly. A couple of thank yous, John. Um, there we go. Thanks for another great session. So some really good feedback and some positive feedback from there from everybody. So appreciate it, guys. Really do appreciate your time out there with John. Um, other than that, right. John, we're going to let everybody go. Really, really, everybody, thank you so much. Uh, I see Patrick just put something up there. Sorry, I'll send the email. Perfect, Patrick, you send the email. That's great. Right, thanks to everybody else. Uh, John, we'll chat later on. You're going to enjoy yourself. You just got a whole day ahead of you. We are uh, time for us to go to bed now. So, sounds good. Hey, thanks a lot. Thanks again. And Colin, thanks so much for your time, man. Absolute pleasure. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Cheers.